Well, good morning, and welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David. We welcome you in the name of God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 36, a Psalm of David. He writes, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we do see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let us pray. Father God, we have come this morning. We have come as a result of your steadfast love and your gracious mercy. We're here because of you and we're here for you. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Help us to do that, Lord. Let everything that is done, everything that is sung, everything that is preached, prayed, said, glorify you. May it honor you, Lord. And in turn, Lord, we pray that you would edify us. May we leave here this morning transformed in our believing, and Lord, applying what we hear, that we would also not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And so, Lord, we submit these things to you, and we ask you these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, and everybody said, Amen. Oh, I need thee, 
Father, our God, we thank you for your precious promises, your provision for us. We are grateful that your mercies are new every morning. And this morning, Lord, we take our worldly wealth and we give to you for your work. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to be faithful in the proclamation of the gospel in Gardner, Greater Gardner, and indeed to the very ends of the earth. Thank you for each and every giver, Lord. We pray that you would bless them in their economies. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in these waning hours of human history. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. We're going to pray again. We do that a lot. And we're going to pray not only for our physical, temporal things, but also for our spiritual needs. Would you join your hearts with mine? Our Lord and our God, we come before you and we acknowledge that you are our Father, our Abba. We acknowledge that you are the sovereign King of the universe. We acknowledge that you are the benefactor of your people, the church round the world. Father, we come this morning confessing our sins. Not a one of us is sin-free, we confess. We confess, Lord, that we have walked in the flesh and not in the spirit, but we rejoice that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because of you it is so, you have put us in union with Christ Jesus. Father, here we are, saved and being sanctified. And Lord, while we have breath, we aim to please you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us do so. We pray, Lord, to will what you will 
at all times. So many times, Lord, we don't, and we turn aside to the left and right. But Father, we want to will what you have us will. Teach us what your will is through your word. Lead us and guide us. Protect us, Lord, and please forgive us when we go off the rails. Lord, we pray that you would cleanse our hearts from idols and wrong paths. May your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Our time is fleeting, Father. May we make the most of it. Seize the moments, Father. Redeem the time. We pray, Lord, for those who are outside of Jesus Christ. They may be in our families, our friends, strangers. We pray, Lord, that you would save their souls. We pray, Lord, for those who hate you, who are antagonistic, Lord, to you and your people. We pray, Lord, that you would save their souls. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we would walk in holiness in our days. We pray that you would give us discernment and wisdom in a time where discernment and wisdom are lacking. We pray that you would encourage every Christian here today, that you would give us health to serve, that you would protect our bodies and our minds, that you would provide for us, Lord, work, wealth, that we could have enough. We pray, Lord, for employment for those who don't have it, for those who grieve, Lord, various losses. We pray you would lift them up. We pray that we would all grow in the grace and knowledge of you. Lord, in this hour, raise up gospel laborers. And may we have the courage of our convictions. And may our convictions be biblical. Give us reconciliation in our families. Freedom from the slavery of sin. Freedom from the slavery of debt. May we overcome evil overcome temptation. Father, give us righteous leaders in the church and in the world. Father, we pray for relief from this global trial that we're all under. We pray, Lord, that we would love you loyally and that we would love others as we love ourselves, that you would help us make disciples. We pray for the church's leadership. We pray, Lord, that our leadership would be biblical and its constitution and number, and Lord, also that our leadership would be following you, the Lord of the church. We pray your blessings upon the region of New England. We ask, Lord, that you would break up the fallow ground, and Lord, that there would be a revival in our time in New England. And Lord, as we go to the word this morning, we pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds, that we would understand it, that we would remember it, that we would apply it, that we would live it. In Christ's name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give, either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. So now we're at Luke 16, 1.
We'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Hear now the word of God. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, that you may be received into eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Once upon a time, there was a snowman. And he was standing straight and strong in January, the cold winds blowing, and there he was, frosty. <laughs> but alas, something was happening. Time was passing, and winter was giving way to spring, and increasingly Frosty's face became sad. And we went to the worldly wise men, and we said, why? Is Frosty so sad? And the worldly wise men said, Because his time is short. And we said to the worldly wise man, He must be really depressed that his time is short. And the worldly wise man said, Nah! He bought a flat screen TV just a few minutes ago. You see, when we feel bad about things, when we get depressed about things, when the realities of life start to hit us, one way of coping is stuff. Get more stuff. 
and borrowing from Veggie Tales, we'll go to the Stuff Mart. And the ultimate Stuff Mart is online, and the ultimate Stuff Mart is Amazon.com. You can sit there in the middle of the night and order something with a few clicks, search through thousands and thousands of things that can be on your doorstep in less than two days. Boxes of junk right on your doorstep. You know, it used to be that when people died, it was kind of a difficult thing because you'd have to find six strong men to bring them into the church. Now you need six strong men to clean out the junk in their houses and throw them in the 30-yard dumpsters. That's something you can do to your kids if you don't really like them. Just uh, give them a bunch of junk when you die. Don't clean anything out. Can you imagine people build up, they accumulate all this junk, and then everybody recognizes it's junk, and you throw it in the dumpster, and there's thousands and thousands of dollars that are just wasted uh, because of our accumulation of junk. Into this comes the Lord Jesus Christ, and he advises us to make a better investment. His advice is contrary to every impulse of a consumer culture because it is supernatural, not natural. He tells us to use our money to make friends that will last forever. The dishonest manager hoped he would be welcomed in the homes of people that he helped in his line of business. We are hoping to be welcomed into inter everlasting glory. And if we've used our money wisely, friends will be waiting there to receive us. Maybe the friends that Jesus has in mind are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. More likely, their fellow human beings we've befriended by helping in our time of need. Members of distant tribes who heard the gospel through a missionary we helped support. Drug addicts that were saved through a ministry that we helped to start. People across the globe who came to Christ through a sermon audio Facebook or YouTube broadcast that you helped finance. Do you realize yesterday you put up a sermon around 4 o'clock and in two hours there were 80 downloads around the globe? It doesn't sound like much, but there's not even 80 people here. You helped finance that. Without you, it would not happen. People who were converted in the church where we tithed, giving 10% of our gross income so that the gospel could be preached. Question, what will you do during your life with your money? It's a very practical issue. Chapter 15 dealt with your attitude towards people. This is about your attitude towards your possessions. And if you do not master your money, using it for the glory of God, then it will master you. And you will end up bankrupt for eternity. Jesus teaches us a lesson by telling a parable, call it the parable of the dishonest manager, and then applying it to daily life. Jesus tells us about a business relationship gone bad. A rich man had a manager. The manager was caught embezzling, committing financial fraud, He's about to get fired, but before he's taken out, 
he cuts deals with all these people. He has them knock down their bills so that they're friendly to him when he's fired. And kind of unbelievably, the master commends him for his cleverness, not for his dishonesty. And this man being fired, he would not sign up for unemployment, for there was none. He would be out looking for other work, probably homeless. That's why he did what he did. He was in a bad situation. He had to maintain his standard of living. His plan was not honest, but it was shrewd. It was a clever scheme. He had people that were indebted to him. So later on, he could ask them to return the favor. Some have tried to defend his actions, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus calls him the dishonest manager. And it's kind of amazing that the rich man, the boss, um, commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And then Jesus says something. It changes in one verse. He says this. Very important. Listen to this. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Jesus is not saying be fraudulent. He's not telling us to cheat people. He's not saying that dishonesty is the best policy. He was giving an example of how someone could strategically plan for the future. And the first point is, be strategic in your reach. Are you living strategically for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or is your only concern your own survival? Or your own comfort? Or your kid's comfort? Or your kid's survival? Or giving your money to the SPCA so that puppies and cats can be taken care of? But forget souls. I'm not against animals, but I'm all big for souls. Last week we said, if we had all the wealth in the world, it would not be worth more than one soul. One soul. Listen, folks, let's put it this way. We could talk about tithing this morning. You've heard it before, the concept. 10%. And you would debate me, you'd say, oh, 10%, that was the law. We're not under the law, we're under grace. You know, and um, we, we could say that, we could get into a little you know, debate, you know. Um, but the point of the Bible is God owns you and he owns everything you think you own. He owns it all. Forget about the 10%. He owns you and everything you think you own. Right? And we have got this notion in America that if we give 10%, we can take the 90% and do whatever we want with it. But you know what? We don't even give 10% in the church. The average amount of giving in the church in America is 2%. 2%. Tithing, there ain't many people who tithe, folks. If there was, we could do a lot of stuff. But there ain't. There's more than 50% in this church that don't support it. You got that? More than 50%. How do you like that? And, you know, there are a few people that are helping the church to move forward. But you see, that ain't right. 
If we were wise, we would invest our money strategically. We would make friends for ourselves. Um, we would give to the Lord because, here's the truth, said by Keith Green, this generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls on earth. How could it be otherwise? If we don't reach the generation that we're sharing the planet with, then everybody dies. Well, looks like when we got the baton and the relay race, we dropped it, right? The people of the light, you and me, stand on the edge of eternity. But we lack the vision, we lack the foresight, we lack the strength of will to do anything about it, especially in our relationships with others. The window of opportunity for the gospel is now open, but closing fast. It's closing fast. And secondly, the point is this, Use it or lose it. You've never seen a U-Haul trailer hitch to a hearse in a funeral procession. You can't take it with you. But if you invest it into eternity, you can take it with you. You see the difference? He says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Wealth and possessions are to be used to win eternal friends. Can you imagine meeting people in heaven and somebody coming up to you and saying, I'd like to talk to you because I was in Zambia and I heard a message on the internet and I got saved and I lived a Christian life and my family got saved and we're here now because of your church in Gardner. I don't even know what Gardner is. Can you imagine? Sound far-fetched? It's not. Your worldly wealth will go somewhere, but you can't hang on to it. You can't. Nor can you buy your way into heaven. We're not saying that. You are saved by grace through faith. That's true. But is your faith real? Is it attended by works? Right? Faith without works is dead. Is your faith real? And a real faith is generous with the gospel of God. You see. What happens to us then will depend in some way on what we do with what we have today. R.C. Sproul used to say, right now counts forever. And Jesus describes our money as unrighteous wealth. Mammon. Mammon is everything we can't take with us. Money, material goods. He advises, Jesus is advising you this morning to use your worldly wealth for spiritual gain. Spend it wisely before you have to leave it all behind. Use it or lose it. You can take it with you when you invest it into the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, I guess there'd be somebody right now that would say to me, oh, pastor, you don't know. I don't give because I'm barely making it. But I'll tell you one thing. If I won the lottery and I won a million bucks, I'd give half of it. And I'd build everything. I'd build churches and hospitals. 
Well, sir, half a million won't help you with that. I, I'll do anything with a guy. I invest it all. I'm going to play the lottery and all that stuff. You, you're going to see, Pastor, what I'm going to do if I get the money. Maybe it's not the lottery. Maybe it's my rich Aunt Matilda. She gives me all kinds of money. To which I would respond, are you giving now? Answer, no. My reply, the things you said you would do if you had all that money, it's not true. You're just kidding yourself. How do you know? Jesus. He says, listen. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. If you ain't got much money, but you're faithful in it, you'll be faithful in big things too. But one who is dishonest with a very little is also dishonest in much. If you ain't given when you have little, you won't be given when you have a lot. You're just fooling yourself. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? He's talking about your money. And as I've said before, your checkbook is the last part of you that's converted. And by the way, oftentimes in a church, it's the people who give little or nothing that are the most opinionated and the biggest critics. I've seen it in my many years of being a Christian. Some Christians want to give you a public impression of their generosity and magnanimity but they're not being good stewards. Beloved, if you walk out of here with anything on your mind today, remember this. We are using borrowed goods and we are living on borrowed time. Martin Luther lived with this perspective. He wrote this. We must use all these things upon earth in no other way than as a guest who travels through the land and comes to a hotel where you must lodge overnight. He takes only food and lodging from the host, and he says not that the property of the host belongs to him. Just so should we also treat our temporal possessions as if they were not ours and enjoy only so much of them as we need to nourish the body and then help our neighbors with the balance. Thus the life of the Christian is only a lodging for the night. Since we here have no con continuing city, but must journey on to heaven where the Father is. Make no mistake, our use of money and the reality of our Christian faith are inextricably linked together. The sooner we realize that, the sooner we will look into our own lives and do something about it. We all have an infinite capacity for rationalizing decisions about money and possessions. What a great, what a great Sunday, huh? The word's making you ner hot and nervous. The, 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 hot, the air is making you sweat. You're sweating on two accounts. <laughs> The ironic thing is that you are 100% certain to lose all the money you accumulate on this earth. 100%. But you are 100% certain to keep all the rewards you lay up in heaven. See the diff? And yet most of God's people major on laying up money on earth and minor, minor on laying up treasure in heaven. 
Thomas Adams said it this way, to part with what we cannot keep that we may get that we cannot lose is a good bargain. Wealth can do us no good unless it helps us toward heaven. Number four, it is totally impossible to serve God in money. No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. There's no metal ground. If you're devoted to money, you will despise God. Clearly, the dishonest manager was living for money. Some think there's a middle ground. There isn't. Some think we can mostly serve God, but keep one foot in worldly wealth. It's sad. The world can point the finger at those who claim to be servants of Christ, but who are really just serving money, serving mammon. They are the ones who get all the press. I remember, um, and I don't know what I'm, I'm not, won't, won't name any names, but this reporter uh, caught this minister, uh, and he was just about to get on a Learjet. And I think, actually, as I recall, she, the reporter was at the airport where the Learjet was, and um, she wanted to engage the man in conversation about his justification for having a Learjet. And um, he really did a poor job of <laughs> trying to, uh, to speak to her. He really didn't have anything to say. He just didn't want to talk to her, was his point. Yeah, but it's easy to look at those things and to say, well, look at the guy with the Learjet. Uh, I'm okay. No, no, no. Don't make money your master. Bring yourself and everything you have under the mastery of Jesus Christ. You know? And, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it's, uh, we get on this track as we're working that we're going to save all the money we can. We're going to save it up, right? We're going to buy a big house. We're going to get a house at the beach. We're going to have a big retirement account. At some point in time, we're going to pull out all the stops and we're going to retire and do nothing and travel all around the world and spend our money and go to our house at the beach and everything will be great. And we're just working for that ideal, making that money. But brother and sister, you have to live now. You can't live at reference to some future time. You can only live now. And I'm not saying you shouldn't save. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a retirement plan. But you should be strategic with what you do with your money. Every one of us is chargeable with what we do. And you know, are you investing into the gospel? There's a grave in Edinburgh. And... Um, the man is long dead, which is where we'll be someday. Long dead, lest Jesus will tarry. Just dust, right? You're going to be just dust. Your body, your bones. It says this, one instance among thousands of the uncertainty of human life. That's what the grave said. In the instil instability of earthly possessions and enjoyments. Born to ample property, he for several years experienced a distressing reverse of fortune, and no sooner was he restored to his former affluence than it pleased divine providence to withdraw this together with his life. The person that wrote the tombstone saying, this guy's an example of someone who had a lot of money, he lost it, got it back, then he died. Now he's here. And then it says this, Reader, be taught by this. 
to seek those riches which can never fail and those pleasures which are at God's right hand forevermore, the gracious gift of God and to be enjoyed through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, years ago, there was a TV game show called Let's Make a Deal. Do you remember it? With Monty Hall? Who was Monty Hall, anyway? It was like this big celebrity. Monty Hall, what did he ever do? Anyway, he was the uh, MC of Let's Make a Deal. And the contestants were told to choose between a prize that was visible and another prize that was concealed behind a curtain. Now, the visible prize was usually quite nice. Maybe it was a new stereo, a TV set. And the audience would always urge the contestant to uh, pick the curtain instead. But sometimes the unseen prize would turn out to be some impractical gag gift, like 10,000 boxes of toothpicks or something like that, or maybe a goat the contestant would groan as he realized he just traded a beautiful prize for something useless. At other times, the prize behind the curtain was something of far greater value, like a new car. Remember that? They'd open the curtain, there was a beautiful new car there. And if the contestant chose the visible prize of the transistor radio and forfeited the unseen new car, you could feel within him the awful sense that he made a very foolish decision. Lost the car, and now he's got a transistor radio that he can listen to as he cuts the lawn. The difference between the game show and reality is this. God has promised us what is hidden behind the curtain. He's promised us that it's much better than what you can see now. In fact, there's no comparison. Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. The question is, will you believe God and live by faith in his promises? Will you use temporal riches, which you'll lose anyway, by investing in the kingdom, the rewards of which you will never lose. It's an easy decision, isn't it? When you put it that way. Now, again, heaven is God's gift. We're not buying our way in. But the question is, is your faith real? Or are you rationalizing? Is your faith real? Does God really own everything you have? And are you using what you have for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your generation? This is your time, beloved. The torch has been passed to you. Like the relay races last night, I watched on the Olympics. This is your turn. You just got the baton. You better run fast. Don't fumble. Right? Think about it. Do you realize that this beautiful facility we enjoy is the result largely of one person's donation? Without it, we would be in a small box right now, sweating worse. And we have a lot of upside potential here with this beautiful facility. Do you realize that I'm the seventh pastor of this church? And I'm standing on the shoulders of the first pastor of this church who planted about 30 churches in Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire, some of which um, we're replanting right now. 
We're standing on that man's faithfulness. And just think, don't you want to be part of that? Do you want to leave a legacy of faith? A legacy of gospel truth, which goes on. People are saved because of what you did in the here and now. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, you can't listen anymore because it's too hard for you. One of the shortest sermons I've ever delivered in the world. I probably should have just not prepared. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, beloved, I urge you to learn the lesson from the scoundrel of the dishonest manager. And that is this. Invest your master's money in that which will pay eternal dividends. Amen? Amen. What? Amen. I can't hear you. Amen. I'm going a little deaf in this ear. Amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we fall short. All of us do. We pray that you would give us the, the grace and the strength to actually put feet on the truth, to actually live out what you tell us to do. Help us, Lord, to live out what your word tells us, to invest into eternity. In Christ's holy name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.
Jesus, give me Jesus. The benediction, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with sincerity. Amen and amen.